Hey there, Spinners and Sharks, Ace of Vegas here, and I hope you're doing well. Or at least better than poor Tim and Tom were. Not that they were suffering specifically, but it looks like they've got some nightlife struggles that are working out this episode. Also, viewer discretion is advised, because there's lots of cleavage in this episode. Is the Ace of Vegas, the Ace of Vegas. One game to 300. So we catch up on the cliffhanger that Tim and Tom left us on last time. I'm not spending much time on it because the show doesn't spend much time on it. Tim and Tom play a quick game of gin, Tom beats Tim fair and square, and they never discuss it again. Not sure why they devoted the opening of the episode to it, maybe because this episode has a theme about positioning oneself. And thus far, Tom has positioned himself to be in an equal spot with Tim, even in this goofy, friendly manner. Tim Poster has heart. Yeah. Tim Poster has heart. Every, even a dog has his day. We're back in action. My kick was getting a little light. Remember it like yesterday. Meanwhile, Matt Dusk does not like the position he's in, because he's still singing in the lounge at Zach's. Which, in and of itself, isn't that bad, but he's feeling like all this practice and effort is wasted, mainly because the audience is more concerned about the menu than his music. The first thing they do is look at the menu and see what's, you know, agreeing with their stomachs. I'm gonna stick with the capellini. So the music is totally secondary, and we kind of become background music. He's certainly the most expensive background track I've ever heard, so either way, he's got his eyes set on the showroom. So that'll be Matt's story for the day. And inevitably, let's welcome our regular ass hotel guest, the... Wait, what? The trashy lingerie girls? Now this is new, what's going on here? Trashy Mary. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Please have a seat. Thank you. Oh, okay. I'm on board. So Tom actually has some interesting information for us regarding casino competition. So in the previous episode, with the Mills family, we discussed how the Strip has silly things like volcanoes and gray water fountains that keep people on the Strip. Unless you're Hog from Hog and Two Cent, but that's another story. Well, Tom's latest plan is to get more folks downtown and back to the Nugget by offering more nightlife. And to promote their new Ultra Lounge, which is just Zach's by the way, they've hired the Trashy Lingerie Girls. Trashy Lingerie is a group of professional models led by the self-titled Trashy Mary, who have a goal to have fun and look good at doing it. This is uh, on your steps for goals, you know, that's where we have to, one of the goals we have to attain for you. While they're setting that up, Joe shows off the showroom to Matt Dusk to keep him motivated to do a good opening for Zach's. Then he introduces himself to the Trashy Lingerie Girls with his title and responsibilities. See, this I can get behind. We're actually focused on casino operations. It's entertainment largely, but this is still pretty cool. I doubt they'll discuss how these contracts go or what the compensation is like, but this is a big improvement over the last couple episodes. Wolfie, you still in, brother? I sold it. Go. Are you anyway, back to Matt Dusk. He's kind of dicking around with his friends playing penny poker when guess who shows up but Tim Poster. I honestly wouldn't have believed that a casino owner was this hands-on if I hadn't seen Derek Stevens downtown at the D in July. Which impresses me, I've never seen anyone like Jim Murin or Tony Rodeo running around the hotels on the Strip, nevertheless actually interacting with their guests or employees, so this is pretty cool. Matt apparently feels the same way I do because he also finds this pretty cool, and unfortunately this gives him an idea. He's planning on becoming best buddies with Tim in order to get to the showroom sooner. But more on that later. Right now, we have to deal with Tom. Tom is in his office with Billy, the nightclub promoter friend, planning the rebranding of Zach's. They've decided to do some more research on the models that they hired, and are shocked at the soft core pornographic performances that they do. Let me recap this. They're doing research on the models they just hired after they hired them. Because Mark Burnett believes that logic and reason are tertiary concerns compared to boobs and drama. This is what's coming down to the nugget. Really? Coming down? They're here. Oh, speaking of boobs and drama, the trashy lingerie girls, who I'm gonna call the TLGs from now on, are getting settled in their room. All of them. 
in the same room for some reason, despite the fact that they're staying for the whole weekend, and I count at least 8 of them. Maybe 12, judging from later shots in the episode. And I'm pretty sure you can't put 8 models in the same room. The girls seem pretty close and open though, especially Friday. She spends 100% of her screen time flashing people. I can't show it on YouTube, but trust me, she definitely gives off the Playboy Playmate vibe here. And I'm sure Tom likes breasts just as much as the next guy. Or a girl, or whatever binary you want. The casino industry has some pretty tight regulations around sexuality and nudity in the casino, though. And given that Tom and Tim have a limited license, Tom is pretty nervous about these loose cannon party monsters that he just hired. They reassure him that there will be no shenanigans, but the show is a little predictable and so is the music. So get ready for shenanigans in the third act. Because we had just invited a bunch of wild women to the Golden Nugget, and I was responsible for them. Thank you, guys. The girls end up on the casino floor, and Zach is watching them. Well, he's watching one of them. This is Roxanne. Roxanne wants to go on a date, and asks Zach for one. In the ultimate bollocks buster, after he agrees, she corrects him and says that she wants to go on a date with Tom. I'm really looking to go on a little date. Yeah, we can do that. Which isn't adequately explained, really. Her motives are rather unclear, and her method for asking him out is really bizarre, too because she asks his assistant to ask him out for her, and that just screams embarrassed junior high school girl. So Zach, being the smooth operator that he is, blatantly lies to Roxanne and convinces Tom to let him have the limo so he can go on a date with the girl who was trying to date Tom. Say that three times fast. Tom and the president of the Golden Nugget, Maurice, are both completely okay with this for some reason. Tom, you're actually considering his request? Oh, I think it's a great request, and I think it actually should be approved. <laughs> to get a girl, okay. I think it should be approved. Go ahead, and in fact, if you'd like, I can personally make the reservations because I have nothing better to do. Because I guess they aren't using the limo for anything else since they don't have any high rollers this episode. And also because being a male executive assistant is total chick repellent, so Zach needs all the help he can get. Despite the fact that he's well-dressed, educated, and reasonably good-looking, dear god, this was almost a good episode. So Zach, as Mr. Steel Yo Girl, picks up Tom's date, who Tom probably wasn't interested in in the first place since he hired her as an entertainer and like any responsible business person, he's probably smart enough not to date his employees. Anyway, Zach and Roxanne make it over to Venetian and they watch a show. Got a little awkward with Roxanne asking where Tom was every couple of minutes. So when's Tom getting here? Soon, hopefully. <laughs> the rest of the TLG show up in Tom's office with- wait, hang on. How is Roxanne supposed to go on a date with Tom? Isn't she supposed to be working with the rest of the TLGs? Why isn't she out with them? Also, if they have access to his office like this, why didn't Roxanne just come down here and ask Tom out herself like a grown-ass woman, instead of passing a note through his friend like a nervous schoolgirl with a crush? Anyway, softcore porn happens, and then we move on to the plot. Ladies and gentlemen. Meanwhile, Martin Ibera guest stars. He's actually running the showroom tonight as the headliner. The showroom that Matt Dusk really wants. Speaking of which, America's favorite Canadian crooner shows up with his future bestie Tim Poster to watch Martin's show. Matt is a big fan of Martin, and surprisingly, there isn't any silly drama associated with this. In fact, Matt has nothing but good things to say. And luckily, Martin also happens to be a big fan of Matt. I'm in this room, and this gentleman here by the name of Matt Dusk, who continues the swing after we're through at Zach's. The food is great. But now thanks to this young gentleman, so is the music. Martin brings Matt on stage, and Matt is just starstruck. He does a little number for the crowd and gets a nice little reaction too. It turns out Tim set up the whole thing as a little treat for Matt for his perseverance downstairs at Zach's. Instead of graciously thanking Tim for doing the setup, Matt gets it in his head that he should just continuously kiss up to Tim like a sycophant, and eventually he'll make his way to the showroom. Because anytime someone takes a step forward in the show, they have to take two steps back. I'm ending my review of Matt's part of the show here. He shows up in the finale, but this is all the story he gets this time. Zack's night, though, is just heating up. Roxanne has pretty much already forgotten about Tom and taken a liking to Zack because of his good looks, his charm, and his good sense of humor. And when I say good sense of humor, I mean he was dragged on stage in a clown mask for some reason. Yes, I promise I didn't edit that in. That actually happens. He's 5'6". Like like this guy, he's 5'6". 
To Zack's credit, he laughs it off, and it looks like Roxanne is having a genuinely good time with him. I think. I don't know. She's been kissing him for a while, though, now. I had a really good time. Thank you. That was such a blast. I can't laugh anymore. You, you really, my face is hurting. What are we doing now? They end up hitting dinner, and Tim calls Zack during dinner. Zack bails out on Roxanne for what seems to be a long time, at least 20 minutes, and long enough to get the check. I actually did have to research this bit, because I figured Zack would have an executive charge-off account or something, and there's no reason the waiter shouldn't have just brought him the bill. Evidently, Zack didn't actually have a charge-off account like that. He did get expenses, but Tim and Tom had to sign off on them. So, I guess the situation is plausible enough. Roxanne doesn't take being bailed out on well, pays the tab, and then takes off. Shoutouts to Roxy, though. She tips well. Then, she goes back upstairs to beat up on Zack a little bit. The other TLGs call Zack out for the stunt he pulled at Zack's, but apparently are completely willing to forgive him if he admits that he tried to trick Roxanne on going on a date. Which is literally what he did. They, for some reason, find this amusing and endearing. Because everyone on this show is a sociopath for some reason. I, did you really? I did. He's hot. Do you look? look. look. Oh, oh my god! god. So nice. Alright, so we are almost there. But no time for that now. Zax is being transformed into the Ultra Club, and the trashy lingerie girls are a go. And to Joe and Tom's surprise, the TLGs do very well. They get the crowd hype, they're very respectful, and they drag lots of people down to the nightclub, and we have another Buffy the Vampire Slayer nightclub scene, which I'm pretty sure is just recycled from the last club scene they had in the Swingers episode. You probably can't tell the difference between the footage. Anyway, the lingerie show goes off without a hitch. It's hardly vintage lingerie. It's really more like lacy costumes and bikinis, but it looks nice and everyone has a good time. Then, Roxanne gives Zack her number in a smooch, confirming that she has forgiven him, and might even be down for a date. But we'll never know, because just like an episode of Saved by the Bell, whenever Zack gets a girlfriend, we never see her again. I'm glad that we pulled it off. You know what, Mary? I'm just glad your girls kept it on. And that is episode 5, and gripes aside, I think this probably has been the strongest episode so far. A shoehorned in contrived love story is the worst thing for any show, nevertheless one like this. That said, at least we got to learn a little bit more about the entertainment half of casino operations. Also, the focus stayed on people working at the casino. Even with manufactured drama, that isn't too bad. Because frankly, I don't care about frat boys or swingers, or country kids looking for a random job in a casino despite the fact that they have a perfectly good license in an industry that Vegas is famous for. Yeah, the casino is really starting to shape up. As far as junk food television goes, this isn't bad, and next week's episode is shaping up pretty nicely. <laughs> Alright, Spinners and Sharks, that's all for today's video. If you enjoyed today's review and found it informative, I'd appreciate a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Stand by for more Casino Madness next week as we tackle Episode 6. Until next time, though, this is Ace of Vegas signing out, wishing you all strong hands, and, of course, happy spinning, you guys. Viva Ace of Vegas. Viva Ace of Vegas. Viva Ace of Vegas. Viva!